So, um, and thanks for the opportunity to come and talk today. Um, so, uh, about something that I've been really excited about the last uh, six months or, or so. Um, so, it's a great chance to sort of play around with some stuff. So, my slides today, so there's a link there. And uh, if you follow that link, you'll find that you're actually loading up a live computing environment. Um, and um, we'll actually be able to, if you want to play along, you can actually do stuff as we go along today. Um, so, let's get stuck into it. Oops, let's put this on the screen. Okay. So, now, it is a live computing environment, and we are actually going to live, run some live code uh, during this presentation. Um, if, so, if you want to play along, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, when you get to one of these sort of cells, just click on the little play button um, so that it runs that little bit of code. Um, Did you send me my link to the validation? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. <laughs> I was on the first slide. Uh -huh. um, so what I'm using is Jupyter Notebooks. And you might all be familiar with Jupyter Notebooks. You've probably seen them before. So um, this might all be, be, be a bit old hat for you, but um, I'll just go through a few things. In fact, I won't actually talk about what a Jupyter Notebook is. I'm just going to show you what a Jupyter Notebook can do, probably in the context of, of uh, cultural heritage data. So let's start. Let's just get some data from Trove. And I'm assuming you all know what Trove is. If you're not, you're in, tro if you don't, you're in trouble. Um, so let's get some data from Trove. I'm just going to do what I said, click on that little play button, set some parameters, goes off, makes a request to the Trove API, and brings us back some data. Uh, in this case, we're getting uh, facets showing us the number of total number of newspaper articles published in each state uh, in Trove, of Trove's 200 million newspaper articles, digitized newspaper articles. Okay, so we've got some data. What can we do with that? Well, let's make a map. Uh, so again, just going to run this cell, and um, what we're going to get is, let's go to the next, so we can actually show it, uh, is a, a chloropleth map, there it is, um, which just again shows us the number of newspaper results per state. So. This is a really simple example of, of really the, the power of, of Jupyter Notebooks with this sort of exploration with, uh, with cultural heritage sources. Now I can make those requests, I can get it back, I can do something with it, uh, and we can play with it, we can start to analyze it all live within the comfort of your own browser. Um, and it's able to do that because uh, we're actually sitting on top of a live computing environment. So, and one of the nice things about this is that it's we're not just uh, limited to what I've put into this notebook. So if I now just go backwards, I'm just hitting shift space to go backwards through these cells. Uh, go back to here. These are all editable. So I can, instead of just having a blank query, which gave us everything, I can search for camels, uh, run that again. Just go through this. We're just going to run it again, make our map again. And then we have a different map. So, not only are they live computing environments, which we can interact with real data sources, but you can edit them and change them. So you can actually use them as a, as a tool for exploration yourself. And that's really the theme of what I'm talking about today. Okay. So what's Jupyter? Well, Jupyter is this presentation. This presentation is a Jupyter notebook. It's using a, a particular sort of plugin, which enables it to be presented as a series of slides, but underneath it's just a Jupyter notebook. As you've seen, it's editable. Uh, in any of these cells, you can just click on them and change any of the, the values. Um, it's shareable, obviously. Uh, and indeed, this live version uh, is um, running on a service called MyBinder, which is a, a, a service which basically you send it a, a GitHub link to your notebook it spins up the computing environment that you need in order to run that notebook, uh, a Docker instance, uh, and then provides that back to you. So it's really handy for things like uh, our workshops. You know, you can actually create a notebook, people can just log on, they can start playing around with it in that live customized computing environment. Why Jupyter? Why am I interested in Jupyter in the context of cultural heritage collections? So, I've been playing around with various ways of working with cultural heritage data for a long time. Um, really seriously sort of hacking collections for uh, the past 10 years 
Um, sharing a lot of code and examples, creating various tools and applications, presenting lots of workshops and stuff like that. But, you know, I've always been a bit frustrated in, in our ability to really encourage and support people's own exploration. I mean, you can present tools and they take you a certain amount of the way, but providing an environment where they're encouraged to actually start poking around inside the code uh, and go a bit further and see where it takes them is been a lot more difficult. And that's what really interests me about Jupyter. So, and, and, and in doing that, in the sort of stuff that I do, the sort of examples that I create, um, I've been focused on two particular issues in relation to, to GLAM collections. That's GLAM, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Um, and they're the challenge of abundance and the illusion of completeness. And what I'm gonna to do today, I'm gonna to explore uh, those two sort of uh, facets um, through the context of Jupyter Notebook by trying a, a variety of experiments and see where they go. So, first of all, the challenge of abundance. Okay, so we can say to Trove, Trove, tell me how many newspaper articles you have about influenza. Uh, and there's a little bit of code which will do that. Um, and if we just run that bit of code, it tells me that there are 1,614,300 digitized newspaper articles about about influenza. And that's pretty common if you're typing something into those digitized newspapers. Of course, it's a, a huge, uh, incredibly rich uh, uh, collection for, for, for many types of research. But it's also a bit overwhelming. You know, how do we make sense of that volume of material? What does it mean that there is 1.6 million results? Um, so let's start thinking about how we can drill down a bit to go down through that results thing. So we could, for example, just do a little quick thing which shows us. Um, oh. they have uh, questions to us. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, nothing going on there. Okay, so um, uh, we've got the. Uh, this is just breaking down by category, so mostly advertising, actually. Uh, of uh, presumably remedies relating to influenza, um, uh, but a significant number of articles. Let's just keep playing around with the possibilities. So let's think about how, how could we look at this as a uh, change over time, look at the number of articles over time. Um, and actually, I've got a, a tool specifically for that. Um, it's a thing called Query Pick. Um, and it's been around for a long time now. So I think I created the first version of this back in 2011. In fact, the, the first version of this predated the Trove API, and it was just sort of screen scraping data out of Trove. Um, but what it does is simply shows you the number of results matching your query for each year. Um, so it shows you the whole of your results set. Instead of seeing a list of the first 20 results, you get everything displayed over time, and you can start to explore that, and you can drill down by clicking on a point. And that's good. Uh, query Pickers is, is, is quite well used and it's actually been um, uh, cited in a number of uh, published articles and books where people have actually used it in their research. Uh, again, the frustration is that it takes you to a certain point, um, but then it's hard to know where to go. How do you follow that through? Where, how do you continue your explorations? Um, so what we can do, again, using, in, in just using this notebook, is to start to build our own version of Query Pick. Transparent version, which actually exposes its workings to us. This is basically the same sort of code that's sitting behind Query Pick. Uh, and in this case, we're going to look at influenza from uh, 1880 through to uh, 1940. Um, so again, I'm just running this code and it's making a request for each decade in that period. So that's why we're getting, it's actually six API requests that it's making. Bringing it back again. Uh, and showing us that, the, and we can then get facets by year. So we can take that, we can again, uh, oops, I'm getting my, my shifts mixed up with my edges. Uh, we can run that one to make our chart, and then we can just display our little chart here. So we see the number of articles over time. So it's just the same like this query pick, just uh, in that notebook form that we can play around with and edit. Um, now, 
okay, that's interesting. But then we might, when we're looking at this sort of thing, we might say, okay, but you know, how do we know there just weren't more newspapers published in 1919? How do we interpret that peak in 1919? Well, one thing we could do is just try dividing the number of, of results by the total number of articles published that year. And it's just a matter of making another API request. So now we're getting the total number of results per each, for each year, and we're just going to divide the number of results from our influenza query by the total number of results for each year. Uh, and create another chart. And we see here it's slightly different. So the, the peak in the 1890s is uh, more significant than it was in the earlier one, but it's clearly, as we all know, the, uh, there was a significant peak, uh, I mean, in, the influenza epidemic in, in uh, 1918, 1919, and that is a, is a real feature of that data. So it's not just a matter of there were more articles, there is something that we all that we're looking at there. So let's focus in on that period, that 1917 to 1919 period. And so in this case, uh, what I'm going to do, or what uh, we're going to harvest is um, uh, we're going to get the uh, make a number of requests, basically one per month between uh, across 1918 and 1919. Uh, and we're asking it to show us this time in the facets the titles of the newspapers that were publishing these articles. Once we've got those titles, what we're going to do is uh, match them up with a, another data set uh, which has geolocated those titles, so it has positions for where those newspapers were published and put all our results on a map. Um, and that's all the code is here. So I'm not hiding anything from it. This is all the code that is, is munging all that data together. It's, it's bringing in the, uh, the location data and it's just using Pandas, which um, is a tool which is heavily used for manipulating tabular data. It's just using that to link the tables together. So if I go here, I'm just going to make the map. And finally, I'm going to show the map. And so we've got an animated heat map, which is actually taking us through that period 1918 to 1919. So we've started with you know, a particular question around uh, influenza. We've seen the sort of full scale results, that sort of 1.6 million results. And then we've started to drill down from that to see what we can find out about those results. And that's all just within this notebook, just those bits of code that I've been showing. There's no sort of magic behind the scenes here. Um, okay, so that takes us to a certain point. And we've been working there obviously with a small number of API queries. We're just getting faceted data out, which gives us summaries of the material. Um, but you know, we get to a point where we're going to want to dig a bit deeper than that. Uh, we're actually going to want to pull out that data relating to those newspaper articles and start to explore that in depth. Um, and we can do that as well. So uh, here's a, I'm going to have a, a this is a, a, a full notebook here now, not not in its uh, slideshow form. Um, and um, we um, so this. Is so a number of years ago, uh, again back sort of 2011 or so, I created a tool to do just that to just harvest uh, metadata from newspaper articles in Trove out into big data sets so that you could get you know 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 newspaper articles which you could then analyze in the sort of tool of your choice. Um, and that's been through a number of revolutions over the year. And at the moment, it's a, a Python command line tool. Um, it's pretty easy to use, but still it has that, that, that barrier in terms of you have to get Python environments set up and you have to uh, install the tool. You have to use the command line, which can be a big barrier to people. Um, but once again, what's cool about the notebooks is I can actually just run that command line tool from within a Jupyter notebook, just within, again, the comfort of your browser. So this is another notebook. Um, I can actually show you that the Trove Harvester is sitting there behind it. So that's the command line uh, tool there. Um, I've set this up with, a, with an API key um, and with a basic query, which in this case is Cyclone and RAG. 
limited to the decade of the 1910s. So all I'm going to do is just run the harvester. Um, and if the Trove API behaves, it's going to harvest about 300 newspaper articles. So in this case, you know, obviously I've kept it to a, a fairly small uh, sample, but using this notebook, I have harvested you know, tens of thousands of newspaper articles. Now, we're harvesting the metadata, so we're harvesting the basic publication information from all those articles. Um, but we're also harvesting the, uh, the full text of those articles. So we can actually, once the harvest is finished, um, start to do stuff which explores both uh, that metadata, the top level information, actually digs down into the text files themselves. Um, and that's just about done, I think. So you know when something's done, when that little asterisk turns into a, to a number. There it goes. Okay, so now if we're running, as in this case, on my binder, which as you know, a cloud hosted service, you want to download your results. So you can just run this cell, it creates zips up all the results into a zip file. I can just run this file, this cell, it gives me a nice download link. I can just click on that and it'll download uh, the results. So I can use this page as a way of harvesting thousands of newspaper articles from Trove, downloading the, the results as a spreadsheet and all those little text files as well. And then we can open up another notebook which gives you some hints for how you might like to start to explore that data. So uh, in this notebook, we're actually going to uh, just quickly open the, the last harvest uh, we can do things like show the newspapers that uh, are represented most often within that set. This is just working on the spreadsheet. Um, we can obviously look at them over time within that set. So we can drill down, we can, we can make a, a simple word cloud. Uh, again, this is just using the titles of the articles. Um, Do that one twice. Um, so these are just hints of, for exploration. So the idea of, of me putting this notebook together is really just to give people some idea of how they can start to again sort of ask questions about that data. And you can actually go further. So there's another notebook which actually uh, enables you to work on the text of those individual files. So there are now 300 and whatever little text files which have the OCR content from those newspaper articles. And you can start to feed them through text analysis programs to look for patterns and frequencies. And uh, there's a little thing here which enables you to do some TFIDF analysis to look at most uh, significant words within each of those, uh, within those uh, articles. So all sorts of ways you can start to explore them. Um, so there's another, there's similar sorts of things that I've been putting together. So there's a harvester for record search, which is the National Archives in Australia, and that was before the metadata out for a whole series. Um, and I've created some sample data sets using that. Um, so this is a series in the National Archives relating to the White Australia policy. Um, and you can have just sort of filled out through this notebook to get a summary of each of these series. Um, and you can then just actually download the CSV file which has the data for it in it. So you get a little summary, you get a little chart so you can see the date range, uh, and there's a little link somewhere or other to download the CSV file. So again, that's using the, the notebooks as a form of uh, delivering data. Um, okay, just quickly, so why Jupyter? Well, you know, I think it's really cool that you've got everything that you need in the browser and it's, that makes it great for workshops. Anybody who's had to do stuff in computer labs and knows how difficult it is in the University of Computer Labs. It enables you to ask questions of the GLAM data and follow where they go, you know, to start big and then zoom in. And of course, you can rinse and repeat. You can start with a notebook and you can go back, you can edit it, you can change it. You know, people often ask me, you know, how, how uh, do I learn to code? And my most common answer is, well, you get somebody else's code uh, copy and paste it and you sort of fiddle with it until it's broken and then you try and fiddle out, figure out why you how it was broken and you fix it and you go through that process and that uh, is really facilitated by the notebooks in that you can just edit it and change it and try it without the worry of breaking anything seriously. Um, okay, so the other question that I looked at is that one about the illusion of completeness. Um, and I'm just going to do another little quick 
trove query here, and this is showing us all of the newspaper articles over time. Uh, um, now, if we if we had the if we could actually speak, I would ask you what that peak there <laughs> in uh, in uh, 1915 represents. Uh, and normally, when I ask that, people say it's the war. You know, there were, but were there more newspaper articles published during the First World War? And the answer is no. That peak represents funding. Uh, uh, in the lead up to the centenary of World War One, money was invested in the digitization of World War One era newspapers. So that peak doesn't actually represent anything about uh, the, the his history. It's just about the way this, uh, the way trove, the policies behind the digitization. And that's really important for people when they start working with these sorts of collections to understand that they are constructed. Um, that you know through accidents of selection, through the implementation of policy, through funding, all sorts of ways in which these collections get created. And you know, I think it's a basic thing that we should be subjecting these sorts of things, APIs and CSV files and collection data, to the same sort of critical analysis that we would if we had a collection of, of primary sources in, in print form. The thing is that it's harder to do, but again, the Jupyter notebooks give us that opportunity to start playing around with these sorts of things in a form that we can easily share, that other people can learn from, and we can all start to understand what's going on behind the interface. Um, and I won't go through it now because I'm at the end of my time, but there's a, there's a notebook there which I spent some time last week looking at the new API from Papa, um, collection API. And it's really great. They've got really rich data there, but there's also some unexpected stuff which you only sort of find out about once you start digging through and making a few requests and going down through the facets. So, why Jupyter? So it's not just about working with the content of the data itself. It's, it's the ability to ask questions around the systems and the technologies and the policies that construct these things that we're using. Um, and the, the real fun part is that ability just not just to tell, but to show, to give people the opportunity to learn by these sorts of examples and to actually do real work while they're learning. You know, you can go back through this notebook and plug in your own research topics, the things which interest you, and you can see where they take you. Um, okay, so uh, the work that I'm doing is sitting here in this repository in GitHub. Um, so uh, I'm in the process of sort of reorganizing everything at the moment, so it's a bit of a mess. But feel free to jump in and try any of the notebooks. Most of them will have links which enable you to uh, open them up in Binder so you can play around as with this one live. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free to, uh, in the issues on any of the uh, repositories on GitHub, to add in any requests or additions that you might like to see. Um, and uh, thanks very much.